apologetics must, must be a part of church discipleship. That's why morality is relative in Americans throughout the West today, because man now determines truth. And I believe that that's why the nation is in the state it's in, because uh, they don't know the Word of God, and because the church has failed, in a sense, to hold forth the Word of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Welcome to Heritage of Truth. Today my guest is Eddie Anders. Very happy to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You were a very, very successful musician, and then you decided that wasn't good enough. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was a long process over many years. I, mm -hmm. I grew up in the church, kind of in a legalistic, fundamental background where I kind of learned to perform for God's people. I got on the platform of the church when I was about six years old and started singing, and that was my life singing for God's people, but it was kind of like living from the outside in rather than the right. inside out. So in other words, everything around you, if you performed good enough, if you did all the things right, God would bless you. And now I've learned the other way around, to live from the inside out. But that being right. said, I went through life that way. And always, I was a you know, people pleaser and a, I had a black belt in perfectionism. So if it wasn't perfect and if everybody didn't love it, mm -hmm. it brought me down. So that's the kind of the background with that. When I got into, you know, I spent all these years on the road with different people, with Gaithers and Truth and a lot of different folks and artists. It was great. Mm -hmm. But you were always working really hard to make sure everybody loved you. And, and, if it, and if, again, if it wasn't absolutely amazing, it troubled me. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is, in the 90s, I had a, we had a place called Eddie's Heart and Soul Cafe, which I describe as a cross between... Uh, Hard Rock Cafe, Cracker Barrel, and Willow Creek Community Church. <laughs> it was very successful. People loved it. We were voted the best in the Smokies for three years. I had it for five years. That ended in a very difficult uh, partnership struggle mm -hmm. where I was trying to buy out my partners, but I was only a 30% equity partner, and they basically forced me out mm -hmm. to take over what they saw as a very more successful than they ever dreamed possible. So I lost everything, uh, forced out. Mm -hmm. So that was the event. My depression was not chemical or uh, imbalance or that kind of thing. It was event driven. Mm -hmm. And with that background of, you know, I've got to do this right. I've got to make God happy. I've got to please his people. In that scenario, all of a sudden, you know, everything ended. It wasn't because I lost the house or that my name came off the sign or the business and the prestige, but it, it, it was almost like I, I got into the promised land and had to leave, you know, and I, mm. and I blamed it all on myself. So that set me on a, on a course for self-destruction. And, and that was in 2000 that I left there. 2001, I had ruptured diverticulitis, gallstones, and mm. appendicitis all at once, which shows you that I didn't internalize the struggle. Right. And I was praying, I was studying, I was working really hard mm -hmm. to, you know, I, was, I became a worship leader in a church. Uh, in the Midwest again, and thought everything, everybody thought I was fine, but on the inside, mm. I was dying slowly. And you got to remember, I was performing for everybody. And I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't pretending, I was really trying. Mm -hmm. But I, I was doing my best as a role as a father, a husband, as a worship leader, as a teaching pastor. Mm -hmm. But internally, I just kept blaming myself for everything. And it ended, ended up with a suicide attempt, mm -hmm. which should have killed me 10 times over in, in July of 2006. And I was gone for three days. They were planning my funeral because they thought it was just a, a, ma a matter of finding me. And mm -hmm. ultimately, I called home while they were planning my funeral. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember any of that. I, wow. uh, and bottom line is, hospital, recovery. You're looking at a guy that took his own life and God gave it back to him. And uh, you can't take all the pills that I took. The ER guys in Minneapolis said you should be dead 10 times over. Mm -hmm. But uh, God healed me, reinvented me, transformed me, did the same for my wife and kids. He didn't just do that for me. You know, they, they were traumatized, of course, oh, by yeah. my action. Had no idea that I was self-destructive at that point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my kids and my wife all write in the book as well, you know, that they've wit witnessed the miracle. They've seen mm -hmm. the change in their father. Mm -hmm. So now it's 11 years later and we're still going strong. And okay. the, the healing has held. Suicide seems to be coming 
an epidemic in this country, especially among young people. How can parents and grandparents help, well, even see the symptoms and then help their young people through the depression or to prevent it or whatever? I don't even know what to ask here. As you and I talked before, before we off camera, mm -hmm. it's become part of the youth culture. Mm -hmm. Suicide's become almost chic. You know, there are television programs that almost make uh, heroes of people that have taken their own life. It's kind of uh, chic and dramatic, and, and uh, uh, there's a flair about it in some, some kids' minds. Sad, mm -hmm. they don't understand what they're doing, mm -hmm. but I think they're just overcome by, by what they perceive as something, the coolness of it, you know, and, and of course, you know, there's always the, the old cliche thing that some of them are just looking for attention and, mm -hmm. the, you know, the cutting and the self-destructive behavior and whatever else. But that being said, parents, first of all, communicate to your kids. You know, I was, I wrote in my book, you know, that part of my culture growing up is that even though my parents were, I wasn't abused as a kid, but they never affirmed me. They never I never, I never heard my dad say, I love you. Mm -hmm. I never got much embrace from either of them. Mm -hmm. they, weren't, they weren't indifferent. They took care of me. It was a good home, but there wasn't affirming. You know, we didn't have long talks. It was just kind of like, you know, if I just did, it was kind of like my Christian life. You do things not to get in trouble. And if you don't make trouble, everything's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but internally, that's not enough. So if parents now find themselves in a place of, Maybe they don't have communication with their kids like they need to, or they didn't develop it. It's not too late. You still reach out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I encourage parents to do it with love and compassion and, and do their best to do that way. You know, being demanding and threatening is not a way to, I think that only makes it worse. Yeah. Especially if you realize you started too late. But, but kids need that, you know, and they, they may not respond, but like in my own children's lives who are now 34 and 32 years old, you know, sometimes I would, I would share my heart with them and mm -hmm. hug them and pour love on them and, and wasn't sure if it was really working at the moment because they were just trying to be cool and I was dad. Mm -hmm. But now, years later, they tell me how strategic and important that was, especially when they look around to their friends mm -hmm. who didn't have that. So first and foremost, reach out in love and passion to your kids, compassion. And then watch, watch a course for troubling signs. You know, kids identify with the music. It's what they program themselves with. I mean, a lot of the music, especially hip-hop stuff nowadays, is so full of violence. They play games. You know, we, we make a big deal about guns in school, but the, the main video games that everybody's playing are, it's all about death and killing and the movies, the, all the movies are horror flicks and, and you know, uh, slasher movies and crazy, you know, it's just, it's become so, and even demonic at this point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if your kid's 17, 18 years old, you're probably not going to be able to uh, keep them from seeing that stuff, but if you see and recognize those signs and being alone, solitude, uh, you know, the kind of stuff they're listening to, the kind of things they're watching, those are all warning signs, especially the solitude. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think um, social media, you just kind of can look at what they do. Again, it's not a matter of, if they're that age, if they're teenagers, it's not a matter of kind of interrupting maybe what they're doing as far as a disciplinary move, mm -hmm. but to be aware of what's going on and, and to interject again with, you know, affirm them and love them and find out who they are and where they are. Lots of parents just, once once a kid's driving, you know, they just lose contact altogether. Mm -hmm. Kids, I mean, that was the way it was when I was a teenager. Yeah. When I was a junior in high school when I was driving, I was gone. Yeah. Now, I wasn't doing self-destructive stuff, mm -hmm. but but I didn't have a relationship with my mom and dad. That, that I'd leave at 8 in the morning and be home at 10 at night. Mm -hmm. Doing good stuff, but yeah. it's a, it's about developing rapport, and and I think that's a huge thing that's missing. Yeah. In the, well, how about when kids say, "My friends understand me better than my parents do." How can parents counteract that? I mean, I, 
I know you don't want to go in and say, I understand you or whatever, but what can you do to help, help them know you care and that you want to understand them? Well, I think first and foremost, and I, I go back to my own experience or working with parents over so many years mm -hmm. in ministry and watching what happens, I think the first thing is to be brutally honest. Mm -hmm. for, for Like you said, if we go in and sit down in our kids' room or call them downstairs at our, the dinner table, you know, and you start pontificating about <clears throat> how you understand what they're going through, and you give them your, you know, I'll walk to school 10 miles into snow stories. <laughs> They're just going to sit there, even if they don't do it physically. They're going to, they're going to internally. They're rolling their eyes and, right. and and looking at their clock and checking text messages. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, it none of that. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You got to be brutally honest, and I think that takes kids off guard. If you don't do the the, the classic, cliche, you know, just uh, brutalizing attack, you know. Uh, why are you doing this? And what did you say that on Facebook? And you know, and what about these kids you're hanging out with? What we used to do is we would invite all of, all of my kids' friends to our house, mm -hmm. you know, and make it a place that they wanted to hang out. That's a good idea. And and you don't lord over them, mm -hmm. and you don't make it a Bible study, mm -hmm. but you make it a safe place where, you know, you know, because most people, there's a fine line between discipline and condemnation. Mm. And if a and if a kid feels like you're always condescending and condemning, mm -hmm. or being an authority figure, mm -hmm. rather than I'm not saying a parent's got to be a parent, and not a buddy. Mm -hmm. You still have to be a parent and a disciplinarian sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if they know you love them first, because what happens with parents a lot of times is they're they're embarrassed, they're embarrassed because of their kid's behavior. Right. You know, you know, Jim and Susie's kid is, you know, doing this and they're a troublemaker. You know, you got to, you know, they're embarrassed by that. So, mm -hmm. so they want to make sure they want to protect. Lots of times, we, as parents, want to protect our image more than we want to help our kids. Yeah. And sometimes you have to sacrifice some things that you may, and 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 I'll use the word compromise loosely. I'm not saying condone mm -hmm. flagrant, ugly mm -hmm. sin or mm -hmm. or evil. But on the other hand, <clears throat> don't don't approach it from disciplinary and legalistic way, but approach it from sometimes you may have to stretch out. Uh, there may be cartoons or there may be something they watch or something they're into or music they listen to that's <clears throat> it may not be your style, mm -hmm. but you're not going to change it by fussing at them yeah. or trying to put, you know, here, listen to this Elvis song. You know what? What about Elvis? They're gonna they're gonna do what they want to do. Music to me was almost a form of rebellion. Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't I wasn't involved in drinking, smoking, dope, or anything. But music was my form of rebellion. It was my expression. Mm -hmm. So that's what kids are looking for. They're looking for a way to express themselves. Mm -hmm. To to be themselves and not be to just find, like little clones of their parents. Yeah, to find themselves. Yeah. And when yeah. they get from fifteen. To 25, most most humans are trying to find out who they are, mm -hmm. and that's where you want to get. That's where you want to get your kids to. Mm -hmm. You want to affirm them. You look at what they're interested in. Talk about what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, find out about who they're listening to. And what's one of the coolest things was when my kids said, oh, "Dad, you don't know about this. It's a hip hop thing about it." And I would quote back lyrics to them, or I would say, "You know, he's doing a concert tour with so and so." And my kids would go, wow, <laughs> you know. So, you know, I wanted them listening to to Stephen Curtis Chapman and Amy Grant all the time, or whoever, you know, right. Michael W. Smith or somebody. And they were in like my, my my girl was into NSYNC and and Backstreet Boys. Mm -hmm. So, I bought tickets for her and her friend, and and me and her mom took her and her friend to go see the Backstreet Boys. Mm -hmm. The way I grew up, that would have been a a sin worthy of scourging, mm -hmm. but that's who she loved. And even though I probably don't agree with everything about who they were or what they represented, mm -hmm. I, I got involved in her life and what right. she loved. And that earned, what you want to do is have a place of, of common ground that you can have rapport and communication. Right. And that's what you got to look to develop. Mm -hmm. If it's always contrary and 
and kind of disciplinary mm -hmm. and there's no relationship you're going to have problems so relationship is the key yes without mm -hmm. question it's still that way with my kids you know mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know my 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 daughter is in hair as a hairstylist and and mm -hmm. they both live in hollywood my son works for disney <clears throat> and and some of the stuff and he's he's an editor and a film editor well, some of the things they're involved in oh, it's like okay they're involved in church, you know. Mm -hmm. They they love Hillsong kind of churches and stuff. We talk every day, mm -hmm. still, and everything is great. And they they're focused on God, but but in their culture, there, it's there's a lot. The parameters are a lot more broad than they were when I was their age, mm -hmm. of what's acceptable culturally mm -hmm. and socially. Mm -hmm. So I may not agree with all that, or the, even the politics or whatever. I don't let anything disrupt our relationship. You start, it's again, living from the inside out. Right. It's trust and relationship, just like it is with our Savior. Mm -hmm. We build from the inside out rather than from the outside in. If, right. Kids, if you do all this stuff, then you'll please me, and I'll, I'll get off your case. Rather than that, no, I love you. I don't care what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't care how bad it gets or what i got to walk through with you. I will always love you. And I will never disown you, and you will be my child forever. Mm -hmm. And out of that relationship, it's amazing how the external things, you know, that's what Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Mm -hmm. Seek first that relationship mm -hmm. with your children, and all these other things will... They're going to fall into they're place gonna fall eventually. Into place. Yeah. And I think, we, I think especially in the culture, you know, of my mom and dad, that generation, they had that backwards, you know. I think mm -hmm. they say of that generation, you know, that they weren't very expressive with mm -hmm. hugging and loving and, and I, I found and talking. that to be. And talking. Or listening. It was, it was career and, you know, I mean, my, I had that relationship with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And I, I treasure that relationship. He basically raised me and taught me. Mm -hmm. and I, so grandparents, you're still really important. Your relevance. Mm-hmm. Very much yeah. so, yeah, even more so. Because, yeah. you know, sometimes kids, they go, they run to grandma or grandpa for mm -hmm. uh, emotional you know, help. They'll go to granddad to talk mm -hmm. and air it out. So yeah. it's good. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded.